Motion to Litsibu. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill to give workers the right to flexible working from the first day of employment, except in exceptional circumstances, to require employers to offer flexible working arrangements in employment contracts and advertise the available types of such flexibility in vacancy notices and for connected purposes. Madam Deputy Speaker, before the pandemic, there was about 60% of the workforce who said they had some flexibility when it came to working. And there are some leading organisations in the field, like the commercial law firm um, Hill Dickinson. There were some astonishing um, organisations in my constituency, like Synergy Vision, which talked about bringing in flexible working for their employers and to increase the happiness in the workforce. And for that, they've been recognised and awarded a Best Workplace 2020 Award. And I spoke to Fiona Dauber, who was the Chief Executive of, of Synergy Vision, and said to her what benefits had come out of introducing flexible working. And she said it's a win-win for both the employers and the employees. And during the pandemic, things change, and a 6% increase in workforce who worked from home. But there is a myth that during the coronavirus, everyone had flexible working and everyone worked from home. And actually, that's not true. The truth is that people from higher incomes and who were earning more were able to work from home and they were able to work flexibly. But that wasn't the case for everyone. People on low incomes either didn't have the flexibility to work or had to retain working from home and couldn't change their working lifestyle at all. In fact, from March 2020, the other flexible ways of working, other than working from home, so whether that was compressed hours, whether that was job sharing, whether that was part-time work working, all declined gradually. And the organisation Pregnant Them Screwed said the number of phone calls to their hotline from women who talked about the refusal they had had when they had asked for flexible working had more than doubled, and about two-thirds of the requests for flexible working had been turned down. Four out of five people in the future want to work flexibly. And there are organisations who are already doing this work. The Royal Air Force, for example, was recognised as a leading practice in this. They were awarded a breast practice for flexible working. There are other organisations who believe that putting the mental health of their, of their employees first is important. And for those of us during coronavirus who were able to work from home and who were able to work flexibly, it was a life-changing experience. There were parents who I spoke to who said that they had never felt more connected to their children. There were mothers who talked about the relief of not being the last to pick up their child from nursery, sitting on the step of shame, as we call it. And I can relate to that, Madam Deputy Speaker. I spoke to disabled workers who said that it was such a relief not to have to commute in the morning to go to work, and that they could sit in their own living room and log on and speak on Zoom to meetings. I spoke to carers who said it was such a relief not to have to worry about whether the pharmacy was closing so that they couldn't get to the pharmacy in time to get urgent medication for the elderly relative that they were looking after. There were people who benefited massively. And the truth is, flexible working disproportionately benefits people who are women, people who are disabled, people who are carers, people who are from low-income backgrounds, and people from a BME background because the intolerant office culture still exists. There's also massive mental health benefits when it comes to flexible working. There was a survey done which showed that 96% of employees said that their happiness levels had risen since agile working was introduced. Not to mention the benefits when it comes to retention and recruitment and it comes to the workplace. Ernst and Young said, now, the productivity of workplaces when they introduce flexible working is quantified at £15 million per year. And an infrastructure and construction company said that when they started talking about flexible working and promoted it, 38% of people started applying more to the jobs that they advertised. There's also the benefit in terms of people who then feel there's a wider talent pool to pick from once they've advertised and once they've said that there's flexible working. But overall, the impact of flexible working is most on women, and that's something we can't deny. In this country, the childcare responsibilities and looking after children does largely fall on women. And the statistics show that if women can flexibly work and go back to their jobs, 
they're twice as more likely to not quit their jobs after they've had a child and to go back to their careers. And the statistics show that men can flexibly work as well. Women are twice as likely to excel in the career that they're pursuing if they have their husbands helping them with childcare responsibility and looking after children. McKinsey pointed out that if we fully utilised women in the UK economy, that by 2030 we would be adding £150 billion to our economy. And a lot of this depends on widening flexible working and making sure that it's bought on. Yeah, yeah. But despite all of these, despite the benefit to the economy, despite the impact on mental health, despite the benefit to disabled people, despite the benefit to people on low incomes, despite the benefit to people from BME backgrounds, there still isn't a culture of flexible working in this country. Since 2020, the number of jobs that have been advertised, only 17% of them have actually said, you can flexibly work if you apply for this job. A third of requests that are made about flexible working are turned down. The problem is, there's a wide range of business reasons that companies can use to say that I will not be granting your request for flexible working. And the problem is that they're just given a blank check. They're not told about the fact that you have, will face some sort of legal restriction if you say you can't flexibly work. There's no point in saying that coronavirus has completely changed the office work culture and that everyone will be able to work flexibly from now on. I have a million case studies at my fingertips, but I'll just use one, which is a mother who looks after a five-year-old child and has a disabled husband, and she has caring responsibilities for her 80-year-old father. During the pandemic, she worked flexibly, and her productivity increased, and this was reflected on her, in her bonus. She then went to her employer when the pandemic sort of has come to an end and they're all going back to the office, and her boss said to her, you can't continue working flexibly which just goes to show that we can't just leave it up to officers to make their own decisions. We've got to bring in robust legislation if we actually want to change the culture and if we actually want to bring in some amount of change. I welcome the fact that the government is actually consulting on trying to make flexible working a default. But I've been in politics far too long and I know that consultations can drag on, they can have the veneer of being true and that we will take action in the end, but it drags on and nothing actually changes. Yep. We in this parliament have the privilege of changing the law so that flexible working becomes something that everyone can enjoy and everyone has the right to, mm -hmm. not just a privileged few who have the perk of enjoying flexible working. So I'm asking the government to pay attention to the fact that I have cross-party support for my bill. Yes. The number of emails a lot of constituents have probably written to you about flexible working. And I also want to ask the government to take this seriously, to bring in robust legislation, to make a difference to the way that we work in this country. And I also want to thank some of your organisations who've pushed for this for years and years and have helped me with my bill. Pregnant and Screwed, the TUC, the Fawcett Society, Mother Pooka, Young Women's Trust, the Gingerbread, the Fatherhood Institute and Woking Families. I hope the government will listen to me. I hope it will listen to its own colleagues who are supportive of this bill and to voices around the house and bringing legislation that changes the way we work in this country once and for all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Laura Ferris, Leila Moran, Christine Jardine, Caroline Lucas, Dr. Philippa Whitford, Claire Hanna, Jim Shannon, Mary Kelly Foy, Crevin Brennan, John McDonnell, Don Butler, and myself. Tulip Sadiq. Flexible working bill. Second reading what day? Friday, 19th November. Friday, the 19th of November.